Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 24. Here with me today is Orion. Hey, what's up? We have Matt. Hi. And again, all the way from Pittsburgh, Wes is joining us. Hello, internet. Hey, hey, Mark. There was some big uh, sports happening over the weekend. Yeah, just a, just a little bit. Evgeny Malkin was named both first <laughs> star of January and first star of the week for the first week of February. Wait, wait, first star? That's the name of their like MVP? It's like player of the week, but yeah. they do three stars. So, uh, yeah. That's just what they do. They, they also do it after every game. Yeah, well, good good for him. Yay, sports. That, that was the biggest <laughs> thing on my... On your sports radar? For the last month or so, yeah. Anyway, we're not going to be talking about hockey. We're going to be talking about hidden movement games, specifically the old fantasy flight. I say old, it's like 10 years old. Fantasy Flight Classic Fury of Dracula and the new up and comer for 2018 Hunt for the Ring. What if you combine those genres? A hockey game with hidden movement? Are you just describing Does blindfolded th- hockey? Maybe one team Is that plays a thing? B- well, I don't Not know. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll no, be no, a what, thing soon. What, what you do is you have to like use projectors and VR so that players can only see each other when they're within like five feet of each other Ooh, like artificial fog of war but yes, yes. hockey <laughs> fog of hockey there's there's oh man there's a new game called fog of war there's a new game that we have called fog of love the next step fog of hockey love war and hockey the three great truths of our <laughs> existence <laughs> oh, so i didn't think about this until today but there is also a hidden movement video game and as your obligatory video game columnist or whatever the heck I am, it's a single screen, split screen co-op first person shooter game where all the character models are invisible. And so you have to shoot other players by seeing where they are by looking at their by screen por- portions of the screen. Yeah, screen cheat. Oh, it's just <laughs> screen cheat the game. <laughs> That's wow. awesome. That's deliciously subversive. That's cool. I like that. So oh, for those... Oh, it's literally called Screen Cheat. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, it's got a 9 out of 10 rating, 405 reviews, $15 on Steam. For those who haven't played a hidden movement game, it is, as the name dis- says, uh, where one person is hiding, and it's basically a, a board game version of Hide and Seek except one person is essentially invisible on the board and they're moving around trying to do something and everyone else is trying to find them and then capture them or kill them or something. The two that we're going to be talking about are two of the most popular. I think Hunt for the Ring is going to end up being fairly popular. Fury of Dracula is a big one. The other two that I know of that have a lot of people who enjoy them is a older game from the 80s i believe called scotland yard uh which is an old classic and i think from what i've read about it is a pretty basic simple take on the genre the other big one is letters from white chapel which just got a new reprint and had a slightly different name and that that's been getting favorable reviews but unfortunately i haven't played them so we're going to talk about these two and i think these may be from what i understand of the games in this genre these are two of the most thematic in that they're very much trying to evoke a very specific theme. In Fury of Dracula, it's about trying to capture Dracula while he runs around Europe, trying to spawn vampires. In Hunt for the Ring, it's the journey of Frodo and his other hobbits from the Shire to Rivendell with the Nazgul trying to find him. And I think both of them really take great efforts to bring that theme into their games. I think the other ones may be slightly more abstract. Anyway, that's kind of an overview of the genre itself. Your definition might have been a little more narrow than what I would have said. I've heard like Captain Sonar thrown in there as a hidden movement, but that's kind of in a different different way. It's kind of a symmetrical hidden movement. Yeah, that that would be... It is a game in which movement is hidden. Yeah, yeah. Diplomacy was brought up as a hidden movement game, which is kind of true. Well, the movement itself is hidden and simultaneous. Yeah, well, that's it's the simultaneous resolving is. That yeah, you, you I guess to, you have to put in your orders and then you see what everyone else did and then you resolve it. That's so, interesting. So when when we say hidden movement, we really mean hide and seek. 
it, it's not the movement. That's, that's the that's narrow the definition. Yeah, yeah. It, the it's narrow more definition. that we really mean these two games. <laughs> well, no, no there we, are other games we, in the genre. We mean that there's there's some thing that's moving around the board, and some people can only track it indirectly. Yeah. So let's go into these two specific games. Let's start with Fury of Dracula. Like I said, both of them are going to have the same thing where someone is is essentially notating where they are moving away from the view of other players. In Fury of Dracula, as you move around Europe, you leave a trail of locations, and there are six of them that stay out. And it very elegantly gives some space for the hunters to try to deduce where Dracula is, because if any of them go to the locations in where Dracula currently is or the five previous locations he was at, that location is revealed. And so that's kind of the mechanism it uses to help them deduce things. Because if you didn't have anything where you didn't get any information, it wouldn't be a deduction game at all. It would be completely blind nonsense. Inferior Dracula, as Dracula moves around the different areas of Europe and goes to these different locations, he'll leave encounter cards behind on the yep. locations. So there may be rats there that attack the players or there may be a vampire that's trying to mature or any kind of trap you know fog is one of them i think bats things bats. that like slow down the hunters or yeah stuff like that i always thought the rats card was a little weird because rats seem kind of below dracula i'm yeah. like oh i'm going to send my rats after you oh. yeah it's it's not very highbrow <laughs> they're giant no. rats or something <laughs> who knows maybe they're vampiric rats and they just make more rats. Yeah. That's why <laughs> Maybe vampires are confined to animals know. with three-letter names. Maybe. Anyway, Dracula's goal in the game is to build up a certain amount of influence, and he mainly does that through maturing vampires, which means if he plays a vampire card on his trail, and that gets all the way to the end of that track, so it gets through six different movements, it matures, and that gives him a certain number of points. So he's trying to reach that while the hunters are effectively trying to find him and do enough damage to kill Dracula. That's kind of the basics of it in terms of the hidden movement aspect. We'll talk about some of the nuances later. In Hunt for the Ring, the ring bearer player playing Frodo is writing the numerical number of his locations as he goes through the map. And the... Nazgul have a few abilities that let them kind of seek him out. So they can perceive, which is an important one, which lets them ask if Frodo is at a particular section of the board. So a certain, the board's divided into like zones. 10 zones, basically. Yeah. Or like three main zones and 10 sub zones. Yeah, it's areas and regions. So I think an area is a third of the board and then a region is one to four chunks within that area yeah so they can ask are you in section 2b and he has to say yes or no if he's in there they can search on any specific location in which case frodo has to the frodo player has to say whether or not that is where he currently is or if that has been part of his trail uh, so if he was there previously and they can hunt, which is basically the same thing as a search. But if it is his current location, they then attack him. And Hunt for the Ring is made by the same people who made War of the Ring. And it has a similar mechanism where the Nazgul are trying to corrupt Frodo. So it's it's measured on if Frodo can be corrupted. And if Frodo gets all the way to the end without being corrupted, he wins. If he be hits a certain number of corruption points, the Nazgul win. And when they attack him, they basically pull corruption points out of a bag. And determines how much corruption he takes. Yeah, it's the same thing as uh, War of the Ring. Yeah, so that's kind of the basics of how they do the hide-and-seek part of the game. There's a lot more to the games. And even when I'm thinking, when I'm talking about that, I feel like the Dracula mechanism is both more interesting and more thematic. In that it makes sense, it makes more sense in the story that... As Dracula moves around, he leaves a trail. Like, he leaves things that indicate that he was there. Whereas the Nazgul, like, perceiving in a certain region doesn't have as much of a tie-in to what the Nazgul are. Hunt for the Ring has a weird relationship with theme, I think. 
and, and in some sense like it's it does theme really well in a similar way to what War of the Ring did. And you can tell it's by the same people who love the the source. But then, yeah, I think you're right, Mark. Some of the actual mechanics don't map onto the theme in a clean way. Like, I can, I can construe them to, to make sense. Like, there's some kind of magic that the Nazgul have to understand if Frodo has been in a location. Like, I don't know, you kind of can construe that, but it's not as satisfying. Yeah, it's not as, it's not as direct in, in a thematic sense. I feel like with Hunt for the Ring, there were a lot of constraints on the design by the fact that they want to tell the story of Frodo moving from point A to point B specifically. Because in Dracula, Dracula can go anywhere in Europe. He can wander about wherever he wants to go. Just because of the story in Hunt for the Ring, it's much more of a linear path. And that, I think, created a lot of very difficult design decisions that maybe didn't work out as well as they had hoped. So because I've never played Hunt for the Ring before, is it really actually laid out in like area 2B or zone something or other or region number slash letter? The whole map is divided that way. There are a big, like, grid. There are big boxes all over the map. Yeah, but there's a right, bunch of numbered locations the... which are connected by paths to all the other numbered locations. So there's this big, in math terms, a chart or map, basically. And there's, you know, a number of starting locations, and then there's a number of these numbered locations connected by so many wilderness pips, which measure distance between those numbered locations. And then yeah. Frodo is progressing distance each, you know, each time he moves, he progresses one on distance, which lets him move towards the next numbered location. And once he has enough pips to get into the next numbered location, then he writes down, you know, 27. And now that's, you know, he's in 27 and he's trying to get to the end within his uh, 16 movements. Yeah, I can understand why they would want to do that for simplicity's sake, but it's not like Tolkien didn't make tons of maps. That's a great point, and I hadn't even thought of that. I mean, just looking at the Fury of Dracula board, I mean, there's nothing terribly special about the countries. It's France, Spain, Germany, so on and so forth, but it looks really cool. Yeah, it is divided a lot more. I wonder, I feel like they could have created divisions within, I don't know how in detail Tolkien got with that area geographically, if they're like counties or if they could have segmented it a different way, Even that, that if was they probably had difficult. Bended Tolkien's exact details, they could have come up with something very Tolkien esque in similar. Yeah, yeah. They could, that didn't. Uh, just I'm looking have at the boxes. game board right now, and they could have come up with something significantly more vibrant and full of life. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So let's talk first about Hunt for the Ring in detail. So one of the things that I, I talked about how they do the hidden movement itself, but Something they're trying to push as a selling point is that the game has two halves. It's played in two phases, I suppose. The first phase goes from the Shire to Bree, and then the second phase goes from Bree to Rivendell. And it seems like they kind of had two ideas of hidden movement games, and they're like, well, we'll do both of them. I don't know. It's not ne- It's not necessitated very, by the story. They're it's also- very similar. It's also kind of shoehorned in to fit the, you know, Frodo's actual journey from the books and yeah. kind of the, the events that happened in there. Thematically, I think that part works really well. You think? I don't remember the books that well. No, like, I don't either. Broad, but even the just, overall arc definitely fits the game. Yeah. The individual actions you know, and the, some like the map division stuff, maybe not as much. But. Yeah, but there was something distinct between, uh, of like Frodo and Sam in The Hobbits bumbling around to Bree. And then, like, the journey changed when... Yeah, they get Strider. When, when Strider joins the party. And then it changes again when they go from Rivendell and you can play War of the Ring. Um, exactly, yeah. I will spoil this. A much better game, War of the Ring. <laughs> but it, it felt to me like they had a point A to point B hidden movement game. And they then they had a couple variations on that. And then they just made one variation the first half and the other variation the second half. Rather than, like, really pick the best version of that game. Yeah, that's true. I think that's a very good point. I, I should explain though. So the first half is a traditional hidden movement game. Frodo's moving around. You can choose where he goes to. 
And then Nazgul are trying to find him and hunt him down and put as much corruption as possible onto him. The second half of the game where you're going from Bree to Rivendell, as the ring bearer player, you draw a couple of options of cards that highlight a predetermined path for Frodo. And instead of choosing Frodo's path, you follow that and you choose Gandalf's path. And the idea with Gandalf is that he's there to trick the Nazgul and get in their way and basically keep them from getting to Frodo. So if they perceive in an area and Gandalf is there, you still say yes, as if Frodo is there, or if both of them are there, or if only Frodo is there. So he can mess up that action. There's an action he can take where he can kind of jump onto where a Nazgul is and raise his staff and scatter them and block their movement a bit. And he can go around hitting a couple points on the board to increase the threshold for winning the game with corruption. So that's the highlight of the second half of the game, but you're not actually controlling Frodo directly. And if Frodo does get hunted by the Nazgul, which he probably will at least once on each half, the game's designed to be that way. You basically just draw a new card and he moves back a spot in his overall distance that he's traveled and he just jumps to a new path. In the first half of the game, if you get hunted, you basically get to escape to You basically a, sprint to the next number. Yeah, you location. sprint to a number connected to where you just were. Yeah. In the second half, though, it's entirely feasible that Frodo's at the very northern edge of the map and he draws a new card and he jumps all the way to the southern end. Yeah, that was a really, like, breaking, theme-breaking... Yeah, thematically, thing. that's the least satisfying thing in this game. Yeah, which is odd to me, because they do try to be thematic in a number of ways. The The look of the game is really, like, like War of the Ring, all the art and the look of the game is very much in line with the original illustrations for Lord of the Rings, yeah, not uh, even the movies. Other than the boxes on the map, I give the, the, the art and feel like an A+. Yeah, it it really evokes the Shire. It's got that nice light green color to the board. There's a bunch of of action cards that the ring bearer can play of different allies in the area, and they got all the random hobbits from the book. I can't Fatty farmer Bulger. Fatty Bulger, Farmer Maggot, I think is in there. A bunch of names I don't even remember. It, it's really loyal to the book in that sense. It's got all you know. Half the locations have the correct names on them of various houses and locations in the Shire. But then in the second half of the game, it kind of becomes a lot more gamey. I think the second half of the game is the weakest part. I don't, I think the, I'd rather play the first half. I just, I've played Frodo. The the first time we played, I was, you were the Naz, or you were Frodo and I was playing as the Nazgul and we managed to hunt you down in the second phase like repeatedly and and finished you off uh and then i played frodo a couple times and got completely stomped once and then we played a second time which was fairly close um i got close to the end but uh you it guys... felt like we were gonna get you yeah um, even though you physically got close to the right end. and yeah i was i ended up only one step from the exit but going into the last day, there was no way I could survive, which is kind of a sucky way to end a game like that. And then Mark and I played once more, and I think what we'll illustrate here is one of the weaknesses of hidden movement games in general is that as soon as you find the person, as soon as you get like a positive location hit, which is pretty much a random guess for a while it completely changes the game and if that happens too soon it can like that one moment can ruin an hour and a half of gameplay because it swings the odds 60 percent one way or something yeah just a quick note i think fury of dracula deals with that problem way better the the inevitability of getting caught you mean yeah yeah like but well let's let's talk about that i think that that illustrates a fundamental difference in well, How well, the games well are designed. as part of being kind of railroaded into this point A to point B story, Hunt for the Ring forces the the hidden player to keep moving on a, a very well defined path. And in I think you said earlier, you get like sixteen movement points on the first half. Yeah, you get from A to B. Yeah, 
And that gives you roughly three or four movement points to play around with. I think with. the fastest movement would be 12 across the map. Yeah, 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 that's the fastest you can get across. And and you can kind of effectively gain a few after being hunted. Correct, which is interesting because in the last game that Orion and I played, I miscalculated at a certain point and I had to be hunted to be able to make it to the end because it accelerates you. What yeah. happens is, as we talked about, there are the named locations that have the numbers that you mark down, and then the, then there are the wilderness spots, which are little just pips in between those locations. When you get hunted, well, I should say that the current location of the ring bearer is wherever his most recent numbered location stop is. People familiar with War of the Ring will note it's, it's somewhat similar to the movement in that game. And when you get hunted, you, after you resolve the corruption, you get essentially two free pips of movement, and then you can go to a connected numbered location. So in the instance I was in, I had messed up and I was, I was basically one movement short of getting to the end. And I was one pip away from my previous location when I was last hunted. And I was then able to move an additional two pips and then another one into the next numbered location, which gave me enough movement to get through. So you really have to make a beeline in a pretty straightforward path. Yeah. And, and, and then use the fact that you're hunted to gain more movement points in effect. Yeah, but But all in all, when you're halfway through that first half, Everyone knows that Frodo is basically within plus or minus one of halfway across the board. And, right, yeah. And, and like even counting up, like the paths are a net kind of stretched ac across, but vertically, there are only like five or six paths at, at most at any yeah, one yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, just right there from the get go, you're kind of squeezing the map down to like he can only be in about a dozen places at any one time and then once you catch frodo then it's it's further constrained by um you know knowing where he was at one point yeah and i think i think that's one way in which narrative just doesn't in which narrative doesn't map onto game mechanics well it works in a book or a movie when Frodo gets caught and has, you know, an exciting encounter and then escapes and then the story moves on and, and, and I don't know, he hides in the wilderness or something. But it doesn't map well onto a kind of railroaded hidden movement game, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it works okay narratively. The problem is... Well, let's talk about this. This is a big topic I wanted to talk about. The problem with any hidden movement game like this is that at a certain point, probably multiple times in the game, you know exactly what your odds are as the hunter. And I've spoken about this with comparing Forbidden Desert and Pandemic before. And I think Pandemic is a slightly weaker game because you get in the situation towards the end of the game where you're like, well, there's a one in three chance we draw the card that causes us to lose the game. And that, which should be an, an element of tension and suspense just becomes well we're flipping a coin in a hidden movement game if you in in hunt for the ring if you if the nazgul hunt F frodo and he escapes and there are four connected locations you know he is in one of those four connected locations and then it's like well which one you know you can make a little bit of psychological guessing of which one you think that person would go to but ultimately it just feels like you're rolling a d4 do we want to talk about why that situation is less satisfying in Hunt for the Ring than Fury? Because I think Fury deals with that better. I think it's something that hidden movement can fall into easily, but I don't think it's necessary. Well, I think it's a fundamental challenge that the game design right. has to try to overcome. Right. In Fury, Dracula's given more room to... Well, there's simply more options that he could go to. So if... Dracula's location is discovered. He can use his wolf card to move one or two spaces, which gives him a lot of possibilities. So that'll open up, 
you know, maybe 10, 8 to 10 different possibilities of where he could potentially be. Yeah, also, when he is in combat, he has a couple escape cards that let him jump one to two spaces away as well. Well, and the other thing is Dracula's movement is constrained only by where he has been recently. Correct. So when Dracula moves, he actually places a location card on this on one side of the board. And yeah, those on that cards, track of six cards. And those cards slide down every time he moves. And and what that means is that he can't move to a place that he's been to in the last six because the card's already on face down yeah, on the board. He can't double back to where he was. And so I think that gives Fury an ebb and flow where Dracula moves in a certain area so he can't backtrack and then the hunters chip away at all the other options and then they you know get to a point where they've kind of narrowed down where he is if they find him and he escapes or a key location slides off of the board all of a sudden that's open to him now right and it can all open up again yeah so that... it gives it it gives it a an ebb and flow that you can't have in a point a to point b right it almost seems like in these kinds of games the most fun part in terms of the hunting is when you have a moderate number of potential locations so you have to utilize kind of the psychology and in fury of dracula the impact of the possible routes he could take so it's like well he could take this route but then he would be locking himself in because he can't backtrack to a certain way so maybe he didn't take that route it brings in more interesting thoughts whereas in hunt for the ring it's like well there are four connected locations one of them goes backwards and he can't afford to go backwards here because he has no extra movement so it's one of these three which are all roughly the same distance from the end even having the short-term long-term payoff uh, decision you know dracula could take like a really sneaky move but it's gonna he, he's gonna get himself into a corner for a couple of turns, right? Yeah. Or he takes the safer one that they'll probably guess, but he'll have more options down the road. The other difference is that Dracula actually fights back when you catch him, which Frodo just like takes it on the chin and runs, and Dracula actually fights back. So in the early game, <laughs> yeah, that's a fundamental you, difference. You don't want to find Dracula because he will mess you up. And then after you have enough like powerful equipment, then you can take him on. Or maybe you team up to take him on or something. Yeah, that's interesting. Both games have a balancing mechanism kind of subtly built in. Where in Dracula, if you find Dracula early, and that's always a concern, right? So if you had a pure hide-and-seek game, it could be ruined by a situation in which they just happen to stumble upon your, your, your path early in the game. And then it's like, well, I don't have any hope anymore. Which happened in a couple of the Hunt for the Ring games. Of the the first one, I, I was I was Frodo. You guys found me on the second move, and you right. knew exactly where I was. And because I'm so constrained in having to go forwards, I mean, you you guys corrupted me. We were me. just able to corral you in the path that we knew you had to take because you didn't have enough room to. Right, I had no options yeah. to juke you because I couldn't go backwards. And I had to sit in a spot for at least two rounds because of the wilderness pips and the way the last location mechanic works in Hunt for the Ring. And I just, you know, I lost in round in part one. And I think the game is strongly balanced so that that shouldn't happen. Right. But that sort of early strong information just the game was over after two moves. We just right. we played so, it out for another hour and a half, but it was over functionally. Yeah. Yeah. So funnily enough, um, I played Fury of Dracula on Saturday and I was playing as Dracula, and I was found on turn two. So and did that ruin I the thought whole game? at first, well, so I thought at first that it was going to ruin the whole game, and I was going to be like, oh no, now it's just going to be a game of like chase the Dracula because oh no, where could he ever go? And the reality is that I just beat the snot out of the guy who found me and then went into wolf form and took off. Yeah, you have and... so much more flexibility there. Yeah, and so by the time the rest of the characters were able to get into the region where I was, I managed to get around them and just sort of, I guess by luck, I got around them by going places that they didn't go and escaped from Eastern Europe into Italy, and they had no idea where I was. 
also the balancing mechanisms I, I was going to point out is that in Hunt for the Ring, if you're caught not in round two, that's, I mean, that's, that was a really edge case situation, but it, if you're caught, you take corruption points, but you get that little bit of acceleration I was talking about. So there's a bit of a balancing mechanism there because you're given, I guess, in the long term, a little bit more flexibility. Just a hair, though. I don't think it's strong enough. You're given a little bit of extra movement, but the fact that your options are cut down from, you know, say, six to two, I don't think it's anywhere near a balancing. It's just you don't instantly lose if they find you, but yeah, getting found early is almost a death sentence, as Fredo. Yeah, whereas in Fury, if they catch you early, you're going to put a lot of damage on them in response, and that may lock up that character for a while as they try to heal. And then, as you know, Wes said, you have the wolf form, you have other ways to escape the situation after the combat, and then open up that the, the possibility space of where you could be yeah. very rapidly, which you just can't do in Hunt for the Ring. Because you're only going to move to one adjacent spot. The difference between moving to one adjacent spot and then two spaces in Fury is tremendous. Right. Because it is just, I mean, it's a map. So it's exponential how many places you could be as you expand the range. Yeah, I think that in, in Hunt, the consequences are kind of additive. Like if you find Frodo early, as we did in a couple games, and you do some damage to him... They're more likely to find him more frequently. Yeah, and there's no satisfying recovery for Frodo. It's just he's in a worse spot doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in Dracula, there's, like I said earlier, there's a little more of an ebb and flow where maybe he gets, he found early, but he actually gets to do more damage. There's a shift of power, is that he's more powerful in the early game. Yeah. Or, late, uh, so or maybe they don't find Dracula. They just find one of his lairs and kill yeah, one of the I vampires see. that he, he left, which is relatively inconsequential. That's but, more a matter but, of preventing him from getting ahead rather yeah. than actively hurting him. Yeah, something. but then, then the trade-off is that uh, the hunters know where he is and they're kind of narrow. They're, they're actively hunting rather than just casting a wide net. But it's satisfying for Dracula then to use his wolf form and escape and just squeeze through the nets and then go back into the unknown. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Playing the games back to back essentially within a couple of days, it's so noticeable how much more freedom you have as Dracula to do interesting things with your movement. In in Hunt for the Ring, you know, you get like one juke on the map and then you just have to make a sprint right towards the beeline. And that's n- j- simply not as as interesting. And that's the better half of the game. The first half where you actually control your movement. The second half, yeah. you're just on a fixed rail and you're just hoping the Nazgul don't find you. Yeah. Because Gandalf has so little impact on what they can actually do because you can't proactively distract them you have to hope that they perceive in the wrong spot and you can throw them off right right i feel like there were interesting ideas in the second half of hunt for the ring specifically gandalf this idea of like the frodo player is controlling gandalf who can create false perceptions he can create false positives on a perception and and then like the ability to control allies which are just kind of roadblocks that can be moved around Like, that has the potential for being interesting. And if you're focusing on controlling those things, there could be an interesting game there, even if you're not actually controlling Frodo's position. Yeah, but but it's not done right. But it's not done right. So, I mean, I feel like if they could have maybe put Gandalf in the first half of the game and not had a second half of the game, maybe it would be more interesting. I think I would actually agree with that, because I think what Hunt for the Ring does well is... The action cards it has, specifically the ones for the ring bearer, I think do a a decent job. They have two primary focuses. One is putting allies on the board, which essentially go from, they they get spawned in a certain location on the board, and sometimes you can move them around, and they just block Nazgul movement. So there's some interesting mind games you can do there with putting allies on the board and maybe grouping them 
to form kind of a wall or to misdirect and send them in one direction and try to send Frodo the other direction or use them when you think you're about to get hunted in a specific spot so you can escape to a, a location where an ally is and hopefully stall them a little bit. I wish you got them more frequently to do things like that with them more. I think the most we've ever had on the board at any one time is three of them. And they give you like eight tokens, so potentially you could get like eight of them up. But it's moderately easy for the Nazgul to kill them. And then I think the, the things you can do with Gandalf, particularly with a false positive on perception, is really interesting. I just wish they let you also choose Frodo's path in the second half. I don't think it would add to the playtime very much. And I think it would make it much more interesting where you kind of plan out both of their paths to utilize Gandalf and your allies the, the best way. Yeah, that could be really interesting. But I think, like, like you mentioned, I think putting it all in one half of the game and basically cutting the time in half would be even a better, more interesting game. Yeah, especially if it's supposed to be used as a game that ties into the War for the Ring. What do you mean by that? Well, doesn't, doesn't this game, like... The outcome it change the setup for the War for the Ring or the War of the Ring. Yeah, they have they have a little rule for that, but it's fairly inconsequential. I was pretty disappointed in it. Yeah, it's like a variant oh, really? that you can yeah. use if you want. But. Yeah, but honestly, like if they just cut the game in half, as we're saying, then it would be quicker and it would be easier to tack on to the beginning of War of the Ring. It was disappointing to me how the consequences of the first half affected the second half. Because they're like two distinct games that are kind of the same, except for the differences we've mentioned. But the only thing that carries over is Frodo's corruption, corruption level. And I just find the corruption really unsatisfying. It's just this number that you have to keep chipping away at as the Nazgul the whole game. I don't think that's too bad. I like that it's similar to the system in War of the Ring. And it, it, honestly, it's no different than the Fury of Dracula thing, where ultimately the game comes down to a number line. I don't know. Maybe it's pulling the damage from the random bag. That Don't be hating on my mystery bags. Hey, look, <laughs> mystery bags are great, but it's not the right thing for every situation. I don't know. I think well, now I got to come up with a game that is entirely mystery bags. Yeah, and one thing we didn't mention about Hunt for the Ring is that it can be fairly long. I think it says 90 minutes on the box. We got a two-player game done when we were trying to be quick in 90 minutes. Our games with three to four players are were easily yeah, we, two and a half we hours. We have to talk about this. So this game is better if you think of it as a really light game. Yes. In my opinion, it isn't designed in a way to encourage you towards that. I think that the game, especially for people who play a lot of like strategy games and usually heavier games, it's in this awkward place of like you want to math out and you want to make the perfect move every turn and you end up just wasting a lot of time doing that. Well, like we talked about, the, the possibility space, once you get to a certain point of the game, becomes fairly limited of where Frodo limited can be. enough that you can waste time mathing it out every turn. Right, but it, see, this is where, we talked about this before, this is where you and I disagree. I don't think it's that difficult to map out the possibilities. I think it's a lot more interesting in Fury of Dracula because there yeah. are more of them, but I don't yeah. think it's that hard yeah, to... Yeah, but you add in some of the Nazgul cards with abilities, and then you start trying to figure out what's the optimal card to play. I don't know. I, I think that with four people trying to cooperate and do the best thing, which feels like it's it, it's that analysis paralysis problem of it feels like it's the best play is within grasp so there are four of you trying to figure out the best play and you end up wasting time and it adds up i think that's only an issue with you like to me well it's the... an issue it's an issue with our group because we spent three hours playing a game that should not be three hours oh i multiple agree multiple times and to me like there's some thought to be put in on the nazgul side but it's all somewhat yeah obvious or it's it's fairly obvious what a good play is or like generally where frodo it, is okay so i i'm the worst sufferer of ap here but it has that problem where it feels like if you invest more time figuring things out there will be a reward even though that reward 
is proportionally tiny. It has that problem. Okay, well, it might have that problem for some well, people. I, I, I mean, well, I think I'm the just issue... saying, I think that if you're a, a game group that's used to playing heavier games, this isn't going to end up being a, a breezy game for you. It's it's going to be longer than you want. Oh, I, I, I would certainly agree with that. I think the problem comes with just the fact that it gives you a little bit of information that you can't share with your other teammates and then tries to have you work together. When honestly, these kinds of games are basically two-player games. It's the same thing we talked about with co-op games. Co-op games are fundamentally solo games, most of them anyway, and they just give certain things that maybe you can't share with your teammates or they just tell you, you know, split up the roles and work together. Or they fundamentally, give you too much information. Or they give you too much information, you know, to effectively... A time limit. A time limit, something like that, to, to make it very difficult to play solo. But they're... Most co-op games are essentially solo games, which means that a game where you have one person in one role and then the other players playing a co-op game against them, it's effectively a two-player game, you know, with some constraints about communication between the players that make it a little bit different when you have multiple players. And that's true of both of these games. But I think because there's more, again, a larger possibility space with Fury of Dracula, the conversations you're having between teammates in Fury of Dracula are more interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Full stop. I mean, that's that yeah. makes Hunt for the Ring. And honestly, I I I enjoyed it at two players. I didn't think it was bad. I th- thought it wasn't great, but it was it was pretty interesting. I feel like I made fine. some clever moves. I was frustrated because the first half I I didn't I be, I didn't get super great RNG at the beginning to immediately find you. I found you in the first half hit you once and then i think i hit you again which you mentioned is needing the extra movement to get out and then in the second half there was one point where i searched a location the turn before you moved there and then i played a card that let me check like half the board or not well a bunch of locations where which would eliminate tons of possibilities and you happen to have the card that countered it and then for whatever reason i just never mentally went back to check those locations So you went all the way across the bottom of the board, and I didn't find you until the very end. Um, Right, yeah. And then I got one big hunt on you, but you just were able to... Well, you had enough corruption that you were okay, but you also... Then you just sacked the whole party and escaped. Yeah, yeah. Okay, big difference between these two games. The damage done in in Hunt is just pulling from the bag, and you either draw numbers, which are just a straight number of corruption damage, or you draw eyes... And eyes are... Their damage is equal to the total number of eyes you've drawn that game. Yeah, so if you draw three eyes, it's one plus two plus three, which is kind of cool. I like that mechanism. It encourages you to hunt with more Nazgul, which increases the number of tiles. Which, again, it just forces you, like, once you find Frodo, all four Nazgul just converge on that location and try to get a triple or quadruple hunt off. The thing about the game is that you're going to hunt Frodo three or four times and you're going to draw from the bag and deal damage in dracula when you find dracula which you you have to do you then fight him and the combat isn't amazing but i think it's fun and interesting it's like this rock paper scissors yeah it's like puzzle bluffing bluffing and it's fun in and of itself it's it's even more fun because of the, the the consequence of the fight it's just so far superior to and, the mechanic or the yeah. encounter in Hunt for the Ring. Yeah, and, and you know maybe you'll pull out garlic or a steak that'll or, or what did I? In the last game, I drew th- three holy bullets cards with the same character, <laughs> and they didn't. You didn't have any guns. And I didn't have sh- a pistol, yeah. but yeah, you know. So in the middle of combat, you might have a pistol, which allows you to if if you win the rock, paper, scissors thing with Dracula, you shoot Dracula, and then you pull out the Holy Bullets card, and that does an extra three damage. That's just all in all more satisfying than this drawing out of a bag. Oh, I think, I, yeah, I completely agree. I think it also rewards clever play in yeah. Dracula, whereas in Hunt for the Ring, the encounter part is just a random damage between one and three, and then finding him is becomes much more constrained once you have the first ping of information. 
Right, because combat as a Nazgul shouldn't be luck. You know, you're a thousands of years old demonic being that that doesn't make sense that you wouldn't use strategy. Yeah, and it's even worse than just plain luck. It's like a counter. It's like how many Nazgul are in the in the hunt? Like if it's three, then you draw three tiles. That's just so disappointing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the combat in Fury of Dracula, it's it's interesting. I, I, I do enjoy it. It's basically spruced up rock, paper, scissors with yeah. with a number of different cards, but they're interesting cards and there's a legitimate bluffing game going on of trying to it's... out outwit your your opponent. The last time that we played Fury a few months ago, I remember feeling so clever outwitting you were Dracula again, Mark. And I remember, I don't, I don't even remember exactly what happened, but I ended up doing like three or four more damage in a certain combat than I, I should on average. And it was just a great feeling. Oh yeah. Yeah. It feels great. I mean, I think the rock, paper, scissors thing necessarily reduces to effectively rock, paper, scissors on some level, but I think there's enough variation and interesting there's cards you can play. Yeah, some hidden information that does make it pretty interesting. Dracula doesn't know what the characters have until they reveal it. And Dracula doesn't have all the moves. He only has five of 13. Right, yeah. So his hand is limited. So overall, I think it's an above average combat mechanism. It's not the best. But I think for a game like this, it does well. And you know, certainly better than, than Hunt for the Rings kind of randomized damage output it's not it's it's not purely random because you once you pull a a chit from the bag it stays out of the bag which is even worse because it's random but persistent it's very mildly random i think it's better than putting them back in the bag it's yeah it it just creates a tighter bell curve basically of, of possibilities over time you're getting really mad at this game i don't like the damage at all it it's worse than putting it back in because it makes you realize that they should have just had a different damage mechanism altogether. I, I completely agree. One thing I forgot to mention that I think it does well, decently well, is with some of the action cards on the ring bearer side where you're able to cancel very specific types of actions. In On one hand, it's it's kind of a take that thing, but I think in a hidden movement game, it works fairly well. Because, for instance, if they perceive in an area, and you have the card that says cancel a perception action, if you cancel that, it creates the mind game of, okay, he's probably in that area, and it would have been a positive that he canceled, but maybe he's trying to bluff out that yeah. situation. Yeah. So I've had a couple of situations with using those types of cards that created some interesting intrigue where there otherwise wouldn't have been. And I think on the flip side, the Nazgul cards are all pretty bland. I would agree with that yeah. too, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And they, they receive a fairly low number of them. I kind of wish there was more on the action cards in general. I mean, just as far as the, the story goes, there's far more to draw from for designing interesting Frodo cards. Yeah, because you have it's, the whole population of the Shire and everyone Frodo's exactly. ever known. or. You know, in things like dwarves on the road or elves or like all yeah. those sorts of things can be a card. In comparison, the Nazgul cards just feel generic and non-specific. Yeah, but I mean, even though the ring bearer cards are generally better, you know, a good third of them just cancel something, which again I think is an all right mechanism and creates some intrigue. But it does, you know, when you compare it to to War of the Rings, really awesome action cards where it has. The action on the top half and the combat play you use, you can use that card for. And they're all incredibly thematic to the story and create great story moments. And mechanically interesting. Yeah. The the Hunt for the Ring cards just seem really bland. Yeah. Yeah. About a third of them are cancel a thing. Another third are spawn an ally and then block the Nazgul from moving or move the allies or something like that. And then there's a few other random ones. So I was curious, thematically, what do we think of Fury? Uh, Wes, I I thought you might have more to say about this. I mean, I don't really know the Dracula mythos. Yeah, let's let's talk more specifically about Fury, because right now we're just basically comparing its good parts to 
the things Hunt for the Ring doesn't do that well. And I think Fury is a Fury of Dracula is a good game, but I don't think it's an amazing game. Although I'm, I, I think Wes, it's one of your favorite games, right, Wes? Oh yeah, it's definitely in my top five, if not in my top three. I wouldn't say that it's all my all-time favorite game, though. It has too many rules, at least for my liking. You actually kind of have to sit there with the rules reference. Oh yeah, that's that's something that Shut, Shut Up and Sit Down talks about when they talk about Fury of Dracula, is that it's one of the few games that comes with an actual rule book, but also a rules reference. Fantasy Flight's that, actually doing that for all their games now. I think Fury was the first game they did that on, and they've continued having the dual rule, rule book thing. Yeah, but I mean, I've played Fury of Dracula maybe eight to ten times, and when I played it on Saturday, we still needed to use the rules reference quite a lot. And yeah, maybe that is me being forgetful. Maybe it's the game having too many rules. I'm not really quite sure, but it, it, it's weird it because... It the, the rules don't really bother me in Fury of Dracula. We always have to look stuff up. What makes it worse is that you don't want to reveal things about your cards, and you need some very particular clarification. Yeah, the need for very specific rules over very specific cards, or like specifics about what constitutes an ambush... When exactly do things get revealed? When exactly do things get played? There's these weird timing things that factor into it. But thematically, I, I feel like other themes could fit onto that template super well. But I'm really disappointed to hear from you guys how Hunt for the Ring really didn't seem to take any lessons from Fury of Dracula and what Fury of Dracula does well, which is take the source material and engross you in it. Because the Dracula story isn't really about all of these hunters hunting Dracula as he cavorts around Europe. I mean, it, 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 Bram Stoker's Dracula all takes place at Castle Dracula mainly, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm remembering from high school, but... I think the first half of it does, and then he goes... If I remember correctly, and this is from the Coppola movie version, which I think is supposed to be very close to the book. It starts with... What's the what's the protagonist? It might be Stuart. I don't Stuart. know. Yeah, I think yeah. He, yeah he goes. It, there's like a he's trying to buy land, or Dracula's trying to buy land. Anyway, he visits Dracula, and then Dracula follows him back to London. I think for the second half, or maybe the last third of the story. Yeah, so it's not this grand chase. It's just a mythos that's been projected onto this game mechanic. And I was thinking yeah. about it while we were playing that it it would be an amazing game if it was Sherlock chasing Moriarty. Oh, like, that would be so good. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. Good. And you could just do it in London rather than Europe. Well, you could do yeah, it any. Like you, you do it many places. Sure. Right. I, I think that it just mechanically, it's a great accomplishment. And the so, fact that it doesn't use numbers and grids and that it has regions and specific city names, like all of that factors into a good gameplay experience. So I think yeah. the idea that he's going around and like creating new vampires, but they take a little bit of time to mature. I'm it's, sold on that being yeah, part of the mythos, even if it the, isn't really. It's the opposite problem that Hunt for the Ring has, where it feels like they cared so much about the source material that they just made a game that wasn't as good as it could have been. I completely agree. Whereas this one has the classic fantasy flight problem where they have an interesting games with some clever mechanisms and then just adds too much in the way of special abilities and action cards yeah, and other fair. cards where you have those rule book problems which as you said are heightened because you if you ask about a particular rule you might be giving away some hidden information but although after playing eldritch horror yeah it's nothing like that i'm 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 more immune to the fantasy flight trappings, I think. <laughs> One thing that you guys mentioned from War of the Ring that I think would be an interesting addition to Dracula is what if you took the required despair points down for Dracula, make it maybe nine or ten, but then in order to win, Dracula has to return to Castle Dracula. So that would give it a destination, Right, but the destination would be like the final four or five rounds of the game of like this mad rush to catch him before he gets back to his castle. I feel like then you, the last five turns of your game would just have the same problems that Hunt for the Ring has. Well, I think it would be the hunters would just camp 
circling around Castle Dracula. Oh, I, that's I like true. the idea, that's though. True. I, I don't I, know how you'd get around it. You might it. have to change the balancing or the combat. And in that case, you would just be leading up to a grand it would force combat a at, the end. at the end. Yeah. Or you could do it a way of, like, have different capital cities. And, like, for capital cities for each nation... Because the, the premise of the game is Dracula takes over the world, right? And he becomes the influencer of all of European politics and European life. Right. So what if, like, it's a random capital that is drawn towards the end of the game that nobody knows? I don't know. It just seems like it, it, sometimes when I've played Fury of Dracula to its conclusion and the times that Dracula is won, it just feels sort of like, oh, Dracula won. Boop. The end. That's true. You know, yeah, like it, if Dracula it, it, wins, it can be pretty anticlimactic. Whereas yeah, if the when hunters Dracula win, wins, they're it, winning. Like fizzles out. They're winning they on win a, a combat. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it, you could make it like Dracula has to corrupt three of the capitals or something, or he has to yeah. do some special action at, you know, more than half the capitals. Or I don't, I don't or, in, or have a situation where when you mature vampires, they essentially add to dracula's combat strength as like a party member almost and then yeah. whenever there is a final showdown however you construct that there's a push your luck element where if he goes tries to do that sooner he may not be as strong but he may take them by surprise i don't know it, it would be interesting to kind of theoretically mod the game to push that climactic ending yeah i i think that it it suffers from, uh, well, for one, <laughs> when I talked to you guys last week, I severely underestimated how much time it takes to play Fury of Dracula. I was thinking 90 minutes. It is totally a two to three hour game. Yeah. Um, and well, the crazy I, thing, just speaking, again, generally comparing the two, they're both really two to three hour games, but Fury of Dracula feels like it has about twice as much game in it during that time. Definitely. Well, except for the right. first few turns, which I'll talk about later. And I was remembering this from previous times that I played through it, too. It feels like Fury of Dracula doesn't have a steady increase of tension as the game goes on, which you would think that it would with all the devices that it puts in place to, like, oh, despair is rising. But it's really just this roller coaster of punctuated encounters that reach, you know, these these really strong orchestral hits. And then there's these moments of, you know, panic as Dracula kind of gets away. And then it simmers down to the search again, instead of like a gradual increase of interest as the game goes on, which reaches ahead at the climax. Yeah, it's one of those games where the most fun parts of the game aren't necessarily tied to the best strategy for winning the game. So, yeah. like you said, if Dracula wins, it's like you flip over a card. Ha ha, I won. But the most fun parts of the game is when you start, like the first time you get a bead on his trail and you're trying to figure out how to cast a net around him and, and figure out where he is. Or as Dracula, when you're trying to do some kind of clever move when you think they're close to finding you out. And those are things that all happen in the middle of the game, not necessarily at the beginning or end. Yeah, I almost like playing the first two thirds of Dracula. <laughs> And then being like, all right, I've had enough. <laughs> well, let's talk about let's talk about things in Dracula, because we've been praising it a lot. And again, I don't think it's a brilliant game. I think it's a good game. And I have two main criticisms of it. The first one is that the early game, like the first five or six turns, feel so dull. As Dracula, you're basically like, okay, what path should I take? Um, which can be kind of interesting. As the hunters... How it's structured is that in each turn or each round is a, is a day and a week. And there's a day and a night phase. And the hunters each get to do one thing during each day and night phase. And they can only move during the day. So that means, you know, at the, at the beginning of the game, you don't have much of a trail to find for Dracula because he hasn't filled up his trail of six cards. So moving doesn't seem that good. So you end up just standing wherever you are and getting a bunch of item cards and action cards into your hand. And then at the night in the nighttime, you can try to get action and item cards, but you run the risk of giving Dracula his action cards. And so the best thing you can do is take these train tokens that help you move quicker across the map. So it's almost like the first four turns for the hunters, except for using Mina's special power, is 
stock up during the day, take the train token during the night, pass. First of all, you can just make it more exciting by taking all the action cards at night, like I did in this last game. And then give Dracula like three of them? Dracula might get three great cards, but you're probably going to get one or two and have some cool items to boot. Yeah, so this is a big point that I was feeling when I've played this game with other people other than the three of you, is that the game is significantly more interesting when it's played sub-optimally. Yeah, and this is something I wanted to talk about hidden movement games, is that it is less fun when you play it like a strategy game and you sit there and be like, he's here, so I'm going to move this person here, this person here, this person here, and then we've got him here. It is more fun when you're just kind of doing things and... Thematically, sometimes. Yeah, but also mechanically. Or playing a, playing a character, it, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's more fun when you just do things in the game, even if they're not optimal, and making a point to not sit there and AP and find the best move, even if it's only 5% better than the first thing you see, improves the experience for everyone playing the game as well as the genre as a whole. Of all the times that I played Dracula with you guys, I think Amber was the only person who ever took events at night. I think literally everyone else really? just took tickets. So this yeah. is interesting. I kind of forgot the nuances of the game today and then orion went and said hey i have to i have a call i have to be on for 20 minutes so i was like i played the first round myself i think the first two rounds actually something like that and i forgot the nuance these nuances so so wes i played it like you're describing like i i just took cool cards at night and definitely gave mark like three great dracula cards yeah it was really nice i didn't say anything you don't want to ruin <laughs> oh no all the great you cards i was getting <laughs> so see, but i did is... get a couple of really cool cards yeah. and i don't know maybe that is that suboptimal oh yeah because you don't have the trail to find yeah on turn one there's one maybe, spot so maybe... out of the whole map where you could accomplish something by moving so i guess th this was actually this game that we're in the middle of now is actually maybe one of the more fun games because to combat what I just described, giving you good cards, we picked up your trail relatively early. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like both sides had good cards and were already hot on the trail, which maybe bypassed, you know, the first 20 minutes problem that you, you have with the game. Oh, yeah. But it's frustrating when that's the fun way to play the game and it's clearly not a good strategy. I'll be honest. I don't know about that. I'm not bothered as much by this early game problem as you are, maybe. Maybe it's annoying, but if it's necessary to have, like, five boring turns while you strengthen yourself and get yourself to the point where you're actually kind of, like, in the meat of the game, that's better to happen at the beginning of the game than any other time. Oh, sure. I just think it's, like, 20 minutes of wasted time. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it this way. I think the game would be improved if you had some kind of auto setup where Dracula picks maybe the first four sections of his path and then the each of the characters starts out with a couple of cards each. That's, if that's that was part idea. of the setup, I think the game yeah, would be improved. I was going to suggest that because just, you know, give each person like a random item, give Dracula, make him choose four spaces and give everyone a train ticket or two and then go. Then there's lots of trail to find and... Yeah. To ride off to, to the races. Yeah. I wonder just, if someone's done that. Just skip like the first two rounds because they're mostly the same. The other big problem I have with Furia Dracula is the train tickets. So how they work is that there are two rail lines on the map. There's the yellow one and the white one. And each ticket will have a different... Roughly speaking, it's Eastern and Western Europe. Yeah. And each train ticket will have a value for the white and the yellow. So there's like a one... There's a few that have... Th Three movement of white and two of yellow, all the way down to what one and zero, I Correct. think is the yeah. is the worst one. And there are only what fifteen, twenty of the tokens, maybe. Yeah, something like that. And what we found is that because you're so incentivized to just stand there and take train tokens at night, you end up getting through the pile relatively quickly. And what we found is the kind of default strategy we've gone into is taking all the train tickets and then making sure to only use the high value ones. 
so that when a card, a certain action card called Fast Horses comes around and it says flip over a random train ticket from the pile and if it has a two yellow on it, you get to move two spaces wherever you want and you get to keep the card. When that card comes around, you can basically design the train ticket pile so that you always succeed the best possible. I remember this strategy and I don't know if I got a later printing of the rules or something, but there were two rules that stood out to me as I was rereading them on Saturday. And that is rule one, no player may have more than two train tickets at a time. This really? was my proposed solution. Wait, is that Let me look the in the rule book. Have we just been playing that wrong? We may have been playing wrong. Does it say it all? Yes, it says... Ah. Hunter performs a reserved ticket action. He gains a ticket token by taking it from the token pool. Then he looks at it and places it in his player. Each hunter can have two ticket tokens. Well, we have to take the last five minutes of the podcast out. Well, no, this is a good lesson in humility. (laughs) And also a lesson in how fiddly some of the rules are in this game. But, well, that's great. Well, that takes away one of my complaints about the game. That makes it, like, a good amount better, actually. Yeah, it actually does. Yeah. It's a pretty cheesy thing. Yeah, so I mean, actually, just to talk about the railways a little bit, I think they're kind of cool. It's like this, it's a it's a quicker movement system, but you have to put some some time into collecting tickets to, to do it. And it, I don't know, like the railroads only go to certain places, but... It oh, can I be, think it's really well done. It yeah. can be really key to have a couple hunters move across the board on the railways and not have to, to spend three days... What well, also creates an interesting dynamic where Dracula can kind of hide amongst the cities that aren't connected by rail. Oh, that's right. And he can't use the rails. Yeah, Dracula can only travel through roads. I think the fundamental criticism that Wes talked about with the game still exists is that it becomes more fun if you don't play optimally. Not, Not be- that you should play bad, but just playing... Chilling out a bit. Chilling out a bit and the hunters occasionally making a mistake makes the game better because i've been in the 1v all position as the one a lot and when you can outsmart them sometimes it's so much better because when i was playing frodo you guys always knew where i was and there was i could the only thing i could do is make a suboptimal move to try to juke you right right i couldn't be clever and beat you i had to intentionally like go sideways and then delay you for one turn but then i'm also not getting closer to my goal in general, hidden movement games are going to have this problem of walking that fine line of it being a good strategy game, but not being pure math where it's just pure deduction. Yeah, pure deduction. There's a fine line to walk there. I think. I mean, I is... think. I think we'd all agree, but I certainly would say Fury walks that line way better. Going along with that, playing a little bit suboptimally. An analogy there is when you're playing a role playing game RPG or dungeons and dragons or something you should play what your character should do that's like the first rule of role playing in power gaming which i'm guilty of enjoying and doing it it tends to make it worse but the point is is that i've come to realize and i think you guys probably already knew this is that when you do what your character would do that's the whole point of the role playing game and you will do things that aren't optimal because you're not a robot trying to find Dracula in Europe and abstract away the theme. You're trying to find this other moving object that's constrained within these set of rules and you have your set of rules. It's better when you play it a little bit thematically and you're like, well, I want to stay in a big city because I like large cities and I want to search at night, even if it's a little dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. To the game's credit, I think Fury, the freedom that Fury gives to Dracula all in all, makes playing suboptimally a little more possible, a little more satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. On the, on the Hunter's part, one of the things, though, I think that also needs to be mentioned is how the length of the game impacts it. Because it's a two to three hour game, as Dracula, I always feel the pressure not to try something really risky or really interesting just to try it out. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I know if I fail, it's just going to make the next hour worse. And... Both of these games we're talking about, again, are two to three hour games. And to me, I think a deduction game like this probably works better when it's a shorter game. Like, I understand that you get more of the theme and you get to play around with a lot more interesting powers because 
even though that allows the game to be longer. But when I think back to a game we I reviewed recently, Automata Noir, that was interesting to me because the game was only 15 minutes long, so I was able to try out different things. With Fury of Dracula, I feel like there's the pressure on me as I when I play Dracula to make sure I don't try anything that could backfire too badly for the sake of the experience of the game. Which is a problem, you know, that can spring up with any longer game, but I think it's more pronounced here because it's a one versus all. I think I have less of a problem with this, which goes back to our deck building philosophies of I will enjoy building a deck, a, a janky deck to try to make it work. And you will try to make a consistent deck that is maybe not quite as powerful or something. What did you guys? That's true. Yeah. What did you guys say in Slack? I wasn't. I, even it was a, part a twi- of the It was actually Twitter. It's on Twitter, Twitter. If you want to go find it, you but were I, like, I yeah. said uh, the key to a good je- <laughs> de- jank deck is having a killer combo that, that works forty. What? That, that you have, a, you have an inconsistent <laughs> path to get to and no reliable catch up. <laughs> so twenty percent of the time, it works a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> And then I said I like to build very conservative decks with kind of subtle interactions and lots of flexibility and, and consistency. Sixty percent, hundred percent, hundred percent of the time they work. Sixty percent of the time. <laughs> and for me, the fun is finding that fun combo and then trying to make it, trying to find the, a good way of pulling it off. It is interesting though how the time of the game affects that trade off. I, th- I think you're th- that. That's a huge point. Well, mark. most critically, is it makes it difficult to develop a meta. Yeah, because like yeah. Re- in resistance, we could play a game in. I mean, we still took way too long on those games, but yeah. But even we could play two games in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> and we also played it whatever fifty or a hundred times or something. Yeah, the only time I, I we did develop a little bit of a meta with Fury of Dracula. I remember Wes when you were trying out different things as Dracula. And so we got pretty good at kind of reading your mind, I think, during that period of time where we played. Annoyingly, it, yes, you did. Like half a dozen um, times in two weeks or something. I kept trying to make the UK gamut, like the UK start gamut work. <laughs> yes. Currently in our in the game we're halfway through, I'm in the middle of a potential UK gambit. Yeah, where are you right now? I'm, I just exited the ocean, but you're not sure where I am. That was one disappointingly of the uninformative. We, yeah, I'm not going to give time... it away, <laughs> but one of the possibilities is the UK. Yeah, the one time that I think it worked best was I went in sort of a roundabout pattern in the UK, and then I wolfed over a location that I had been to previously to get to a location that I hadn't been yet. Oh, I remember that one. Oh, that's yeah, good that, that was that was the most successful iteration of that strategy because it 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 definitely convinced you guys that I was somewhere that, you know, was had had space to roam, I guess. In in this game, I actually did kind of the opposite of that. I wolfed over a spot and then went back to the spot I crossed over. Oh, yeah. Which was fun. And it threw them off a bit. Yeah, no, it that. That was like the the possibility that we knew was there, but it was like the least possible possibility. So that was good. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And then that brings up another comparison again in War the, or in Hunt for the Ring. You just don't have enough movement to be able to do cool backtracks like that. Yeah, yeah. Just sad because these these are the moments that make Fury of Dracula fun when something clever like like that happens and the hunters know Even that when... you slipped out of their net and they have to rethink everything. I mean, there were moments where Orion and I were mapping it out and we were like giving every given everything in the last three turns. We know Mark is in one of these three cities. It doesn't feel as bad in this. Game it doesn't feel do as bad, and and ultimately Mark did something pretty clever and it threw us off for an extra day or two yeah i will say i like the rhythm of a nazgul turn better than a hunter turn even though the things you do in dracula are more interesting just the way that in hunt for the ring frodo moves once the that's divided up into each day is three phases there's two days like a morning an afternoon and then a night and the nazgul move faster at night but the Nazca always get a move and an action. And the action can be search. It can be, you know, do one of the more powerful actions by spending a die or hunting or something like that. Whereas in Dracula, you have this really awkward thing where you can only move during the day. And then unless you found a location that Dracula's on 
and you're searching the city, you're just going to sit there again and draw a train ticket or maybe draw an item card if you're in a large city and want to risk the event card. And so I just, that, that flow of move and action, I think, is much better than the awkward split day action in Dracula. Yeah, I couldn't agree more there. It's really annoying in Dracula where your your turn is so tiny. It's just broken up too much. It's, it's too staccato. And it's in some sense, that's a very minor complaint, but you do feel it throughout the game. Yeah. It's one of those things where because they have the turns set up that way, they have this whole dusk dawn situation where if Dracula is revealed during the daytime and, and you combat at dusk, then it's slightly different than if you found than if he revealed himself at night and you find him in or and you fight him in the dawn and it's stuff like that that probably could have been removed from the game and aren't completely necessary that muddies up the rules a bit. I I like the idea of a hidden movement game. I think it's really cool, but I think there are these fundamental limitations to the genre that are tricky to get around. Yeah, I feel like that's something we've all kind of agreed on is the idea is fantastic but how do you make it better because there's something missing in all these games and i'll throw it out there and i haven't thought about the idea that much but i think the idea of a hidden movement game in which there is the possibility of a traitor on the hunter's side for lack of a better word maybe could make that interesting because then fundamentally you can't know the exact odds of someone's lying to you it would require more hidden information, it, but I think it could be... There's potential, I think. It may be. There's also potential that the deduction would be so thrown off that like you could barely be certain of anything. Yeah, it's one of those solutions that just creates other different sure, problems sure. to try to overcome, yeah. which can end up... I've read a lot of de- designers say they they often find these solutions that just make bigger problems and they multiply and they have to go back and like, okay, that that's just not a good solution. It may be one of those situations, but from a design standpoint, I've added it to my list I, <laughs> of potential design ideas. My idea, which I don't have, I don't know how you would implement this, but just in general, being more probabilistic, because it, it is the cases in War of the Ring where like you just know that Frodo's in one of three places and... I don't know. As Nazgul, you don't have as much movement to try things as you want. If you gave everyone more freedom, but then it was all probabilistic somehow, I feel like there could be something interesting there, but I don't know. I well, don't that, know would, you, that would make it more variable. It'd be more variable. I don't know how you would implement it, though. Yeah. I think Fury of Dracula is close to being probably as good as a three-hour hidden movement game can be. Yeah. You know, it could be streamlined a bit more and some polishing on the rules and making it less fantasy flightish. But I think to be a better hidden movement game, it probably has to be shorter. Because the meta, yeah. like, being able to develop a meta game would be so cool with this genre. Yeah. yeah. Also, I, I think both of these games could benefit from a shorter mode. Well, in Hunt for, for the like- Ring, they do recommend that you play the first half. And then they give you like an envelope to save important cards, and then you reconvene for the second half. I don't. That wouldn't improve the game really. But like, if anything, the, these games feel like the kind of games that could be easily converted or modified in some way to be a shorter party game, like an hour long party game. Yeah, and I think I think I remember hearing that the new Whitechapel game is about forty five minutes to an hour long, which is exciting. What about, um, do you know anything about Spectre Ops? Isn't that another one? I was just about to mention Mark, who's a patron of the Thoughtful Gamer, who's watching this podcast recording live. How about that plug? Just mention in the chat that Spectre Ops does have a trader mechanism as an optional rule. And so maybe we'll have to check out that game because yeah. I think that could be super interesting. And I think it's, I think it's supposed to be a bit shorter. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, and we know there's more of you out there because we see the download numbers and you can join us live by becoming a patron. Uh, It only takes a coffee a month, basically. You get to support amazing content and you get to join in the conversation with us live and hear all the things that get cut out because a lot gets cut out. Not even a good coffee, like a pretty mediocre coffee. Like a plain black coffee. 
You might be wondering, who is this voice that just plugged Patreon? Well, that's Wes. We just cut out everything that he said previously. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah, like like a small black coffee from Starbucks. (laughs) A month. (laughs) Well, from Starbucks. (laughs) Not from Starbucks. You know what my favorite hidden movement game is? What's that, Matt? My favorite hidden movement game is Capture the Flag. So there are two ways to play Capture the Flag. There's one just out in the day in a big field where you have two obvious flags. And does everyone know how you play Capture the Flag? Yeah, it's like a giant game of tag, but the field's cut in half. When you cross into the enemy's side... Suddenly, if they tag you, they can capture you and put you in jail. I was under the impression that was the only way to play Capture the Flag. Well, without modifying the rules, except some maybe small clarifications, you can play this on, say, a campground at night. And then it isn't primarily a game of speed, although there are encounters where you're running from people. It's primarily a game of stealth where you're trying to sneak around the opponent's side and get in position to to attack to make flag. a dash for the flag but exactly. come from somewhere they didn't see and get much closer than you could otherwise. Exactly. Now this is a game idea. We should turn this into something you play while sitting down indoors. <laughs> oh gosh. I'm joking. No, that sounds Mark. awesome. Yeah. That sounds yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, um and I thought of this late in kind of thinking about this podcast but i don't i don't know what you do with that for board gaming but there's like that version of capture the flag as a teenager had the perfect amount of just like slow slow building dread of getting captured but excitement as you got closer to your goal and then those moments where you're you know someone sees you and you take off running and it's just the adrenaline's pumping Oh, that's that's great. So I don't know how you would capture that in a board game, but I don't know. Night capture. Well, you clearly can't capture it entirely, yeah, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> I I think it's one of those things where you can look at a real life experience and something like that and say, what can we do to emulate that in a board game? It's a great reference point. Yeah, my memory of that game, specifically the playing at night thing, we actually did that at a camp that I went to when I was younger, and... I was a huge fan of the strategy of, oh, okay, well, I got to explain how uh, one little nuance of the rules is that it was pitch dark and staff members on each team had flashlights and they were basically led around by that team or like representatives of that team. And that's essentially how they checked for who, you know, was what team, because otherwise you really couldn't tell because you were wearing a bandana, like a bandana on your arm that had a team color. And I was a huge fan of the strategy of look as normal and boring as possible and just avoid the flashlight people and inch closer to the flag over the course of 10 minutes. That's that's pretty great. Yeah, like just mill around trying to look super normal or not super normal, as the case may be. And in the last moment yeah, that's of heroism. Great, you're like, it's, it's like you're using the, the meta of what's important in your... You're subverting it in a way that, well, I'm not important. And then you're just all of a sudden you're next to your goal. Right. Have we discovered, gentlemen, then that the best board game is, in fact, life? (laughs) (laughs) And that's a wrap. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Don't forget to check out all of our other things, including a more detailed written review of Hunt for the Ring. You can see all that at thethoughtfulgamer.com. You can hit me up on social media. I've been on Twitter a lot lately, which you can find through normal internet ways. You're smart. and <laughs> Yeah, do tweet us. Tweet Mark all of your thoughts on this podcast or life. The greatest board game. Or summer camps. Or summer camps. Sure. Or capture the flag. Mark is also on Facebook at The Thoughtful Gamer. And you can rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Or wherever you listen to podcasts, if they have a rating thing. And as we mentioned before, if you'd like to watch our future podcasts live and join our awesome Discord channel where we chat about board games all the time, just go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer and pitch in a cheap, small coffee worth of money every month and you'll help us keep doing what we're doing i'm very close to hitting 
the goal that will give us kind of a break-even point financially for 2018. So I would greatly appreciate any help in that regard. We'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Peace out. See ya. Thank you for joining us this week on the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, where Mark finds his true calling as a camp director. Thank you. And good night.